Hello, I'm Sophie Waring. I'm a PhD student on the Board of Longitude Project here at Cambridge and at Greenwich. Um, I've also been working hard on the JISC digitisation project and I'm here with Simon Schaffer. <laughs> I'm Professor of History of Science in Cambridge and I'm the Principal Investigator for the Board of Longitude Project which is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And yeah, over the last 18 months, we've been collaborating on a project funded by JISC um, to digitise uh, all the surviving papers of the Board of Longitude and related archives. Um, and it's been a fascinating and challenging task. When we think about the Board's archive, what do we think that it encompasses? So the Board of Longitude was set up in the wake of the 1714 Longitude Act, which established a series of rewards for a discovery of a method for finding longitude at sea. And between the 1730s and the board's disappearance in the 1820s, um, it accumulated enormous amounts of information, correspondence, mariners' logbooks, details of voyages, of new instruments and schemes, and in more than 60 surviving volumes, which were gathered together after the board disappeared, so were gathered together in the 1840s and 50s, um, we have an extraordinary insight into the world of science and the state, of British and overseas innovation, of scientific travel and exploration, and I think, above all, it throws a remarkable light on the very complicated networks of skill, of artisanship, and of creativity, some rational, perhaps some less rational, that flourished in 18th and early 19th century Britain. What does it give us about broader 18th century and 19th century mm. cultural context? One key aspect of the board's archives is that they reveal very detailed relations between the British state, artisans and instrument makers, navigators and gentlemen of science. And these relations can be traced in extraordinary detail. And very often, the people who were proposing schemes to the board were people about whom we know almost nothing else. So, simply as a biographical archive for 18th century innovation and creativity, it's remarkable. But I think there's more than that, because over the uh, decades of its career, the board was charged with a very wide range of responsibilities, not only um, judging schemes for the very complex and crucial problem of marine longitude, but also, for example, the search for the Northwest Passage between the Atlantic and the Pacific through the Arctic, um, the establishment of overseas observatories, methods for using magnetism, improving compasses and navigation instruments. And in the widest possible sense, this was really the first government organisation whose brief was to encourage scientific and technical innovation. So by tracing not only the biographical records, but also the administrative and personal records that are contained in the archive, I think one can build up an unprecedentedly rich picture of what culture was like in the age of industrialization, of reform, of revolution. Okay, so it must also tell us quite a lot about the international community as well and how Britain is trying to race against other countries. For That's them. absolutely right because the relationship between the British community and other communities is sometimes competitive but it's also sometimes deeply collaborative. The board attracted uh, global interest and its schemes were applied globally so that there's material in the archive um, correspondence, maps, charts and logs from the South Atlantic, from the Pacific, from the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. And there are schemes that arrive from across Europe and North America and elsewhere, bringing in uh, people like German professors, French aristocrats, uh, Dutch schemers and Italian surveyors, for example. So it's a genuinely global resource and it's been underused because it's been hard to access.
Right, so this brings us on to the problem of digitisation, or the glory of digitisation, I should say. Yes, I mean, I think it's a remarkable event and an extraordinary achievement of the groups who have been involved, um, led by the digitisation team at uh, the University of Cambridge's library, um, and in collaboration with uh, people working at the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich, and here in Cambridge at the AHRC Board of Longitude Project. It's required a lot of work, um, as I think you'd be the first to agree. There's been some effort. <laughs> and it tells you both about the advantages, the extraordinary advantages of digital humanities, and also I think about the unexpected consequences of doing this work, because as part of the scheme for the Cambridge Digital Library, maintained by the University Library, the system of cross-referencing, of mm -hmm. hyperlinking, which can carry users of the site from one place in the archive to another, from different archives to other archives. So the way we've set it up is to link together material from the Board of Longitude with material from Greenwich, and indeed material from other apparently unrelated archives, the Newton Papers, for example, also held in Cambridge. Um, what that shows is that you can make connections on an intimate as well as a grand scale that I think it would be almost impossible otherwise to do. Yes, again, okay, because they're bound into volumes, so yeah. you can't cross-reference yeah. easily, but you can on the... And I think you've found that <laughs> there are discoveries you make that one wouldn't have anticipated making the material that you need to access the archive this way. Absolutely. I think digitising the archive and having to produce the metadata that will introduce the archive to sort of end users means that has, has completely changed the direction of research in the project. Yeah. What we discover has changed both the PhDs and the doctoral level kind of research that's going on. You find something in the archive and you think, great, I can incorporate that into my narrative, or you think, oh no, this completely compromises my narrative, and now I have to move in a completely different direction. But because of the vigilance with which we had to go through the whole archive, we've really got to grips with the Board of Longitude like no one ever has before. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, your work has been really impressive in the team. And I think what it tells you is that one perhaps thinks of digitising an archive as an end in itself. Yeah. So that it's simply making a resource for others. And there is certainly that aspect. I mean, there are sites which will be developed as part of the project for education, for school use, for use by other researchers, for example. The logbooks of the Board of Longitude Archive contain invaluable climatological, meteorological data, which I think will become usable now. There will be biographical and prosopographical resources that other people who aren't us will use. There'll be education packages. But for me, the main take-home lesson has been that this is an open-ended project. Yeah. Um, because the Cambridge Digital Library has the resources to maintain this site, I think we can look forward in the coming years to more and more information and further projects and further schemes and I think further exciting results from the work we've done.